My name is Richard Hardiman. I'm a, an entrepreneur and a very accidental environmentalist, and I'd like to explain my journey of how I got to this stage and standing on this red dot. This is a whale shark. A whale shark is a beautiful ocean-going giant that lives in our oceans. It gains its nutrients from its big mouth. It sucks all that into its belly. It really is a beautiful, beautiful creature when you're up close to them. It's been a real inspiration in my business for the last couple of years. But not only is the way shark endangered, so are our seas and its very environment. Being in Cape Town a few years ago, I had a realization. If you've ever had that thought when you look at something in front of you and you think, and you know nothing about the process, but you're watching it and you're seeing it and you think, these people are messing it up, I can do this better. You have no understanding, but arrogantly you believe that you can do it better. I had this situation right here in Cape Town about uh, four years ago. I was having a very slow day of work. I decided to bunk off, and I came down to the waterfront about five minutes away from where we are right now and had a cup of coffee. And in my caffeine-infused procrastination, I watched two men in a boat try and clean the waters here of plastic waste. It was a very windy day, as it can only be here in Cape Town, similar to today, and a lot of trash was going into the water. Added to that, the tide was going out, and I was watching the tide take the trash out through the harbor walls as these guys were trying to clear the water. And their only defense to combat this trash going out was the guy in the front with a pool net. That was it. His only defense against nature and man's inability to tidy up after themselves. So I'm in, <laughs> I'm in the waterfront and I'm watching this tide go out and I arrogantly think to myself, not knowing anything about maritime practice, waste management in water, or how the men do their job in the boat, I arrogantly thought to myself immediately, I could do that better. I really thought I could do that well. I live my life by a few simple rules. One, I believe sincerely that necessity is the mother of all invention. That assumption is the mother of all you thought it, not me. Assumption is the mother of all mistakes, and that ignorance is bliss. And ignorance on my journey has brought me to this place right here. So I started doing a little bit of research, which is very unlike me, and I went onto the internet to have a look at how this kind of thing is done elsewhere in the world. Surely in LA, in London, in New York, first world countries, first world cities had a first world solution to picking up trash out of the water. And I came to three conclusions. Number one, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, the predominant way of taking trash out of a water in a harbor or a marina is this. Two men in a boat with a pool net. So South Africa is right up there with technology in that respect. <laughs> the second conclusion that I came to was something that only the internet could throw up. And that was a rabbit warren of links to data, to videos, to articles on just how bad the waste in the ocean had gotten. And when I first started talking about this in, in my head, I thought to myself, I'm not so much worried about the trash, I'm more annoyed about the inefficiency in this process. But as I started going through these war rabbit warrens of links and articles, I discovered actually I'm more worried about the planet's safety here. So I needed to come up with, with a solution. Let's look at some facts very quickly. Eight million tons of plastic go into the ocean every single year. Now, I'm not too sure if 8 million tons really registers with anybody. It might sound like a lot to you. It might not sound like a lot to you. But get, getting to that 8 million tons of plastic point, if you know how little plastic weighs, means we have to have a lot of plastic. Maybe it's easier to visualize this. This is a blue whale, another beautiful ocean-going giant. It weighs upwards of 200 tons at a time, which means that every single year, humans throw the equivalent of 40,000 blue whales into the water every single year. Now maybe that still doesn't resonate, so I brought along some props. It's my job now to catch plastic on a daily basis. So this weighs about one kilogram. Standard plastic, it's come from my household over the last, uh, over the last couple of days, embarrassingly enough. Weighs about one kilogram, which means there's that eight billion of these bags is what we throw into the ocean every single year. Eight billion of these bags into our beautiful, pristine, once pristine oceans every single year. The sad thing about that is that problem only gets worse tenfold over the next decade. 
This plastic floats around and gets taken out into our oceans, but it's not getting there by boats in the oceans and people just randomly chucking their plastic over the sides. 80% of any plastic that ends up in the ocean comes from our shores. It comes from harbors, marinas, rivers, ports, stormwater drains. It gets taken out on the tide into the sea and ultimately ends up in our oceans. Once it's there, it starts to break down. It doesn't break down completely, of course, because that takes a thousand years, but it does break down under weather conditions, sunlight and wave action to a point where it becomes small enough for marine life to start consuming it. Every single year, we lose one million seabirds to plastic ingestion. 100,000 sea mammals, marine mammals, to plastic ingestion. And untold losses to our fish stocks that we haven't even been able to quantify just yet. But why would a fish eat a piece of plastic? So recent research that has come out and showed us that fish like to eat plastic because it tastes like their food. In this paper that was released this year, it turns out that as the plastic breaks down, it's colonized by microorganisms that fish kind of like. It's the same microorganisms they normally find on their, on their food. So their senses trick them into eating the plastic. What should give them life is actually killing them. But the joke is actually on us, because the more and more that we do research here, we're finding that that plastic is returning to us on our plates. We throw our trash into the ocean, the fish eat the plastic, we eat the fish, and the circle of life, or death in this case, is completed. I'm not an engineer. My mother is an artist, my father is an engineer, which makes me a daydreamer and a procrastinator who hates inefficiency and time wasting. Years of therapy, years of therapy. But when I started researching this problem, I found that maybe I could contribute a little bit. I was quite arrogant at the start to think that I could change things, but I started on a journey. And what we did was to build a robot. This little guy, I don't know if you know him, but I'll explain if you don't. His name is Wally. He is the star of a Pixar movie uh, that came out a few years ago. And Wally's job was essentially to clean up Earth trash. Humans had left Earth in fancy spaceships because they didn't want to live amongst their trash anymore. And they left Wally and a few of his kind to clean up our mess. What I liked about Wally was that uh, he did his job day in and day out without complaining. He went to work, cleaned up the trash, came home, recharged, the next day went out and did the same thing. To paraphrase very badly, I might add, um, my business partner, Oliver, he sees a world where robots do the menial tasks, the tasks too demeaning, too repetitive, too not needed for humans to do. So robots get to work and humans get to live. And I kind of like that story. So what does a man who was born in the 70s, grew up in the 80s with Star Trek, Star Wars, and the imminent promise of jetpacks that still haven't arrived, what do you do? You build a robot. And this is what we built. This is the waste shark, not the whale shark, and it's built on the same principles as a whale shark. It's got an enormous mouth. It silently skims the water and tracks down its prey and keeps it in his belly. I'm going to show you a little video quickly. So that was my idea from a coffee to a couple of years ago. The version you saw there can take up to about 200 liters of trash out of the water in any one deployment. Uh, the batteries last for eight hours a day, so you can send it out as many times as you want. And it's a robot, it's a drone. It goes out and can be manually controlled with an Xbox controller, so the kids love it. Uh, you can also set it on a iPad to go in one certain area, tell you when it's full, and bring the trash back. What I really like about it is though, that robots like to talk. They like to send and receive data constantly. So we've equipped our waste sharks with environmental sensors. Um, we can take up to 200 plus environmental sensors on any one waste shark. So we can tell you the depth of the water, the temperature of the water, the turbidity, the chemical makeup, 
the salinity, the conductivity, it's endless. These robots speak to us and they tell us about their environment. And what really excites me as we start sending these around the world, that in four or five years' time, we're going to know our water very, very intimately from a data point. We're going to take our trash and harvest data. And that, to me, for a technology point of view, is very, very exciting. So if you haven't seen enough of me already, I thought I'd just give you four shots. All different lighting. I was talking about blissful ignorance a little bit earlier. And about four years ago, three years ago, I was diagnosed with depression. And I don't want to say that to get sympathy, but it makes me no more, more normal and more kind of aware of what I'm doing. And the blissful ignorance in my, in my, in my part was that I didn't understand the journey that I was starting. I'm not an engineer. I'm not someone who thinks he can do big things. I'm not someone who automatically goes out and makes a difference or wants to make a difference. But from the point of having that idea, I grabbed it, I went forward, and I took it to Rotterdam, where we started building these things and started innovating and introducing ourselves to a lot more clever people than myself to start dealing with these things. And I realized in the journey that if I had known what we were going to face over the last three, three years, the financial crippling, um, <laughs> crippling-ness, is that a word, that uh, really sort of attacks you as you try and get these technology companies off the ground, or the mental um, challenges that you have to face, the challenges to relationships, the challenges to my family being away. If I knew all of that beforehand, not even including what we had to do in order to get to that video that you've just seen there, I wouldn't have started my journey in the first place. I would have been too scared. I would have been too afraid. I would have gone... No, I'll just stay in the waterfront to drink coffee and procrastinate. Thank you very much. So that blissful ignorance to me really turned me into an activist and, and an accidental environmentalist, and I'm quite, quite proud of that. This man, the late Jacques Cousteau, environmentalist, ocean explorer, said, people protect what they love. As an accidental environmentalist, I now truly believe that our oceans need to, to be protected. And I would like to impart that, and hopefully that you love the ocean too, and would also like to help protect it in some small way. Thank you very much.